Hello again, and thanks for joining me. Today, we're going to look at my scientific brain theory known as Patham theory. Patham theory postulates that all a brain can do is store, match, and use patterns. The assumption is that a pattern cannot be divided beyond a certain point, and as it is indivisible, I call it an atom. That's why we have the name pattern atom or patom. We'll look at what the theory is claiming, and then we'll introduce how it applies to language learning. This is the core design of our natural language understanding engine, NLU, and so far we've had no limitations in converting words to meaning and back again. I like this quote by Albert Einstein because I think it applies well to science. The scientific model has to be simple enough so that it explains observations, but not so simple that it can't explain the observations. And so what we're going to look at today is pattern theory, my theory of how brains work, in order to explain what's necessary as input to natural language understanding. Um, so a brain is simply modeled with these patterns. There's sets and lists, and it's hierarchical in that uh, if you start from vision, you've got senses, which then feed through into brain material, which is recognizing vision, which then connects into other brain material that deals with multi-sensory information about, uh, about the objects of the world. Um, and it's got to be bidirectional, because if you can take what you've recognized um, uh, through your senses and then take that and then apply it back to the senses, you then don't need some other encoding system. You're simply going from what you've recognized to then using it again. Um, now, obviously, it's not working like a movie, but the, the principle is that whatever is, is there in sensory information gets combined and then we can apply that uh, in order to um, deal with novel situations. So that's it. Let's go into a bit more detail. Um, so here's my model from the 1990s. And what, what it shows is that you've got those edge patterns. So the pattern atom is, the, uh, um, is matching patterns from either vision or auditory. And then it goes into an area which is simply looking at vision. So um, for a visual pattern to then go into, um, for vision to then go into a visual pattern, um, it, in a human brain, it gets broken up into things like motion and color. So you can actually have deficits where you lose um, your uh, ability to recognize motion or your ability to experience color. In fact, if you lose the V1 area in your cortex, you actually lose the ability to see. You can't even imagine what you've seen before. It's quite a, an interesting observation, and that's one of the, uh, uh, one of the things that we've used to justify this, this model. Now, all of um, both of those senses then go into a, an association pattern, and that's how you can connect what you're seeing with what you're hearing. And there actually needs to be some other um, breakdowns as well, but we're just showing in, in concept that if you have some sort of visual pattern and at the same time you have some sort of auditory pattern, you can connect them in an associated pattern uh, and then uh, work with those two things. And because it's bidirectional, you can then go backwards. So um, that, that's the principle of uh, pattern theory. Now, I think it's, it's important to recognize that a human brain is simply a more evolved brain. Uh, so uh, dogs' brains are actually extremely complex as well. And with my dog, um, she's only a pup, but she, she recognizes me and she has a certain behavior when she sees me. So I know that she's recognizing me. Uh, but regardless of what I'm wearing, she always has this very sunny disposition towards me. Uh, but at night, I've been walking towards her and she's very fearful because she doesn't know who I am. And the point I'm making is that once I call out, she recognizes me and immediately changes to the normal behavior. So she has the ability to uh, recognize through both auditory and visual systems who I am. So there's a, another representation of me um, based on pattern theory that we can apply to explain that behavior. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. But when, when we talk about pattern theory, here, here's one of the fundamental building blocks. Uh, you start with um, a bunch of visual patterns. So you can, you can see there on the left, there's a bunch of uh, Cs. I think there's some uppercase and lowercase, and there's some script versions. There's a Gothic version that doesn't even look like a C. And all of those things are being linked in uh, a common area. So, so in terms of vision, you start with a set of elements that represent something and then you group them all together into a set. So if any of those are matched in the future, they activate that particular set. Um, so uh, what this allows us to do is have a whole lot of things which don't 
um, make any sense as uh, as building blocks because some of those C's don't look anything like C's. But by connecting them all in a set, if we match any of those elements, it's like having multiple templates to, to match. And it can all be then driven by the brain based on experience. So if you said this is a C and you see a, an image of a C and then this is a C and you see another image of a C, even if it looks radically different, you're able to then group all of those into a set. Um, so it's effectively knowing what something is that allows you to connect with its vision. So you're sort of learning in reverse. So let's just look at that in a bit more detail. Here's a, a bunch of different forms of cat. We've got, let's see, an uppercase C with little at. There's different fonts. There's uh, um, and, and effectively all of those things are simply recognizing that one symbol C. And I'm in fact showing it as an X because uh, in the network it's just going to be some active node. You would have to go back to the thing that called it, to the thing that connected to it, to know, hey, this is a C. Uh, and um, you can see then it's being used in a list to produce the word cat. But we're going to go through this a couple of different ways just to give you a better appreciation of, um, of how the theory works. So we're going to start with cat, and this could be the smallest symbol in um, a particular language, so C-A-T. I mean, as an English speaker, you know it's not the only letters, but that's what we start with. We simply store it, and there we go. Um, we've just stored a new symbol. Now, we get another element, act, um, A-C-T. And at this point, you can actually recognize that we would be trying to store A more than once, C more than once, and T more than once. Um, so what we're going to do is decompose that. So the brain is constantly decomposing, and pattern theory says we only store atoms of pattern, patterns. So we're going to store the atoms. There's ACT. Now we're going to add a list. And the, the list isn't ACT. It's actually references back to the elements that we've just created, because those elements are, of course, part of a set, as we just saw. So now we connect from that list, and we see that we're connecting in that sequence CAT. So there's our cat. We'll be able to get rid of that CAT symbol in a moment. And now we're going to store the new version that we've got, ACT. Um, again, it's just a list. and. Uh, we get rid of the CAT and now we're done. We've just learned. So um, looking at that another way, here's our experience on the right. And we've got our set of, at set of atoms on the left. We've got a, um, a few letters there. And then in comes the experience, CAT. Uh, it then recognizes that from the atoms that we've, that we've um, already stored. There's our letters. And effectively, we're learning a sequence CAT. In effect, it's going to be XXX pointing back to the set of atoms, which points back to um, the sensory experience. But um, you can see simply by experience, we're now able to build up a vocabulary of these lists based on the set of atoms. And because those atoms are parts of sets, we can now recognize them in a wide variety of ways with different fonts and um, cases and so forth. And that other information about the different cases and fonts can also be learned um, and then used when we're trying to do other types of things consistently. Okay, so there's there's a bunch of words. At this stage, there's no meaning to those words. All we've done with this brain science is store lists. The reason we're doing this is because the same approach of lists and sets we're going to apply to absolutely everything um, in the NLU system. Okay, so. All of those are nice uh, animations that show you what a person would expect to see. And um, this uh, example on the left, we see cat going in through vision. We then break it up into its letters, and then we store it in sequence. So you, you see cat and act and uh, two in, in that um, example on the left. But the example on the right is what we would really see um, in a brain, because nothing's got labels on it. There's nothing stored. All of the information, if you want to call it that, all of the patterns are simply uh, extracted from an, a hierarchic, from this hierarchical model. So it's the sensory information that's matching a group of patterns, in this case, the uh, characters. And then those characters in sequence um, are, are the actual pattern that, we're, that we've learned. So all we're seeing is Xs. It's unlabeled. And that type of um, challenge is what uh, really um, uh, reverse engineering a brain is going to have to do in the future, finding this type of information. Okay, and uh, look, let's let's just have a look. I'm um, one of one of uh, the, the books which, um, which I use. Here it is, just handily at my feet. So there's a uh, Marvin Minsky book from um, I think 1985. He's um, called Society of Mind. Uh, Minsky was an interesting character because he's one of the uh, early AI proponents and um, 
just has a very distinguished career at uh, at working through AI. Um, Oliver Selfridge was one of his, I think, advisors, and this example, the cat, uh, was something that was a challenge. So. Um, if you go back through the history and you find all the problems people have um, produced, all of those need to be resolved for um, for true AI. Um, and and here, uh, in this case, you see the cat. And how do you resolve that if you're using a processing engine? Well, you have to somehow work out whether it's an H or an A, just based on the character. And it's impossible because the H and the A are actually the same character. Um, and so when we apply pattern theory to this, the first thing would, that would happen is you would recognize both an H and an A. And that's great because now you can pass that through to the next layer, to the next pattern, which is then working out uh, the known words. And in, in this case, we don't know the word um, TAE and we don't know, know the word CHT. So they're not actually matched at the word level. So the only words that are matched are the plus cat. So we can pass that information through and we've got the cat. Um, so a very simple illustration and this, this applies also very generally um, in, in our uh, meaning matcher in order to get answers when there's a lot of ambiguity around. And, you know, hey, let's just shout out to Oliver Selfridge because uh, um, th these guys really have, um, have made the science what it is by recognizing what needs to be solved. Okay, let's just take the first model that we had where we were matching sequences of characters and now let's go to the next level where those sequences of characters are being fed through to a new set of atoms which are those words that we've recognized. And the, these are like the uh, formal linguistic words, they're meaningless symbols, we don't know what they mean at this stage, but um, we've now been able to recognize a sequence. There's the cat, um, now the dog has come in as two separate words, we're matching those um, as our atoms. and. Uh, Effectively, the set of atoms in this case is our vocabulary. And now we, we hit an obvious problem you're going to recognize. So now we're using the cat twice. So that's violating pattern theory. So we would need to actually have an intermediate layer if we wanted to use the cat twice. But we're, we're not doing any um, abstraction at this point. We're simply taking those literal strings and matching them. Um, because sometimes uh, in, in a language, those literal strings actually are the meaning. So like international business machines um, is a name or um, you know Barack Obama was a pre is the name of, uh, of an ex-president of the United States. So um, wh whether or not you're recognizing the individuals or the, the larger groups of words is determined by the meaning and we haven't gotten to that and uh, that's what we'll get to uh, in a future session. Right, so that wasn't too hard. That's the, the pattern theory um, done reasonably quickly and uh, effectively what we're doing is we're decomposing everything so that we can find the atoms that remain and the learning mechanism isn't what you'd expect it's actually the higher level in the hierarchy um, determining what the meaning was of the lower level thing because ultimately the meaning is the thing that the brain knows uh, not the meaningless symbols that are coming to it okay Let's apply this to language learning at a very high level so you can get an appreciation of why you would even bother with this. Okay, so we, we looked at how this multi senses coming in and inside those senses we're then able to take a category like cat, which is um, obviously uh, multiple animals that, that fit into that um, particular category, um, but all of those get um, boxed into their vision and hearing and tactile and, and their senses, you know, well, you know, how you feel, the, the cuteness, the fear and so forth after a cat's uh, maybe scratched you or bitten you, all, all of those things are done um, by a brain. So a dog and a cat's brain, in fact, would have uh, a lot of this um, available to it. But ultimately, pattern theory is saying we have an atom that represents all of that. So there's our little x which represents the cat atom. So uh, let's see if we can learn reference. So, you know, places, times, things, which uh, um, will be stored in that um, system. So firstly, we'll get a sound like cat. And how do you connect cat to the cat atom? Bang, there it is. It's a bi-directional link straight to that atom. And now if you recognize a cat, you'd be able to recognize the sound of cat. Now, um, obviously you don't speak with your, hear with your ears, you speak with muscles. And um, so that's a separate issue. But fundamentally, um, we've simply just created that bi-directional link. And now we have the sound being connected to that 
wealth of information about a cat. And here's vision, bang, bidirectional link. Now we know that CAT uh, is connected to that, that same element and equally you could go backwards down that other link and say CAT is uh, pronounced cat. Now predicates are a little bit more complicated. Uh, predicates relate. Um, reference refer to things in the world and they've got their own um, uh, relationships as well, but um, a reference sit inside these predicates also, uh, and you can see here, here's the predicate eat, and in this case, eat is relating an animal eating food. So um, again, we're just introducing the concept, so predicate here has an actor, which is the thing doing the eating, and an undergoer, which is food, the thing being eaten. Um, and we've, um, through a different mechanism, uh, uh, associated the meaning for that. And now what we want to do is learn the sound. So we hear eat, bang, bidirectional link. We now have the eat atom connected to that. And um, obviously if the brain is automatically recognizing eat, uh, you've got that active in the brain and you've got the active sound. And that's why you can learn these things uh, without any type of um, complex processing engine. Uh, similarly, vision, EAT, we just again do a bidirectional link. So there you have it the introduction to panem theory, and I hope some food for thought. The brain doesn't need to look anything like a digital computer, and our experience shows that for human language emulation, our model removes the complexity a programmer would otherwise need to handle. Next time, we'll flip our view from this brain-based model to one starting with the science of language, linguistics, and the amazing theory based on the study of the world's diverse languages, which then became role in reference grammar after something like 40 years of work. Until then, take care.